that are going to share their expertise and knowledge of um, not only the Civil War, but also reenactment. And they brought a lot of their really neat stuff with them here today. So I'm anxious to see what um, they have to share with us. Um, this is Dan Wright and Aaron Cohen. And um, obviously, they are going to be talking about two different sides and two different perspectives on, on the war. Um, but uh, they will also be taking your questions. So um, at the end, if you have any questions or are curious about anything, please um, ask and share and enjoy your afternoon. Thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dan Wright. This is Aaron Cohen. Um, and we're here to share um, our uh, interest in the Civil War with you. Um, we are uh, uh, largely self-educated on, on the Civil War. We've done a lot of reading and research, um, and it's just something we have a passion for. Um, I'll, I'll start off by just kind of introducing uh, the Civil War. Um, some of you probably know about, more about the Civil War than, than others. Um, the Civil War was fought Americans versus Americans. Um, it was, it's uh, a defining moment in, in our country's history. Um, and in a lot of ways, it kind of gets um, put into a box, and we don't talk about it from that point of view of Americans fighting Americans. Um, and so it's, it's a very interesting uh, point in history. Leading up to the Civil War, there were some very politically polarizing issues. One of them was slavery. And with that, with that hot button issue, um, there were a lot of um, very vocal people on both sides of that issue. Today we can go and we can look at MSNBC or we can look at Fox News and see very polarized different views of the same things. Okay, and the same story being put that way. That was the same type of thing that was going on at the time, but people didn't have media sources like you have today. Um, you had the local newspaper, and you might not see another newspaper from anywhere for weeks before you saw the news from other places. Um, they didn't have radio and television and the internet that we have that fill our uh, consciousness with, with the way news is. And so we like to think that, oh, news is news, but it was a lot of political co commentary to it. And when you hear, well, this guy, if he gets elected president, he's going to do all these things. Well, we hear that now. You know, if this guy gets reelected or if this guy gets elected president, if this is going to happen, okay? But imagine if that's the only news source you're hearing. And you can understand how people would get kind of riled up and start getting, oh yeah, we gotta do this, or we gotta do this, we gotta back this guy, and we gotta back this guy. All right, and so when they, the election of 1860 had the Republican candidate of, of Abraham Lincoln uh, running against several Democratic candidates. <coughs> and because of that, um, the Democratic vote gets split, Abraham Lincoln wins the election, even though he doesn't win the popular vote, he does win the election. He carries the most number of electoral votes. And so he wins the election, and all these people in the, in the South that had been vehemently against Abraham Lincoln and thought he was going to do all these terrible things, then react, and probably in a lot of ways overreact. The ideas of secession come out. All right, and the idea that, hey, you know what? We don't want to be a part of this country anymore. And they vote, their legislatures vote, and their popular, their, their voting population in their states vote to leave the union. Okay? And by the time of the inauguration um, of Abraham Lincoln, six states have seceded. You know, six states have seceded first. Uh, South Carolina was first. South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia. Um, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. Those six states secede before Abraham Lincoln's even president because they're afraid of the way things are going to go. Okay? In South Carolina, in Charleston Harbor, there is a United States uh, coastal battery, a fort called Fort Sumter. All right? They needed to be resupplied. That's in South Carolina. South Carolina says, no, this is ours. We own this. The federal government says, no, that's our fort. We're going to resupply it. Okay, the forces, the Confederate forces, the, the South Carolina forces around Charleston Harbor saw that as an act of war and began shelling 
Fort Sumter, shocker throughout the world, beginning of the Civil War, Civil War um, in the United States, and um, they shell it for three days and no one gets killed. But it's the beginning of the Civil War, okay? In response to that shelling of Fort Sumter, that shelling of the uh, United States Fort, Abraham Lincoln calls for 70,000 volunteers. He calls on all the states to send regiments um, to, to put down this rebellion in the South, okay? And so this call for forces makes states like Virginia say, wait a minute, we're going to raise forces to fight against other Americans? To fight against our neighbors here? I don't think we're, this isn't what we're talking about. So after the call for volunteers, seven more states secede from the Union. Those states are Virginia, Missouri, uh, no, Missouri, I'm not going to say Missouri. Um, Virginia, Tennessee, Texas, Florida, um, Arkansas. Oh, I'm missing. Mississippi is in the first group. Kentucky. Kentucky doesn't, well, Kentucky and Missouri were both, uh, had two different legislatures, one that seceded, one didn't. Um, anyway, then it gets to 11 states that end up seceding after the call for, uh, so you, you have a split United States. You have states like Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland that are on the border, okay? Missouri, Kentucky, and Maryland are all slave states, but they don't leave, they don't secede, okay? Uh, Maryland decides to stay neutral. They vote to not be on either side, okay? Um, Missouri, the governor says, let's secede. The legislature says, let's don't. So the governor went and led troops against the legislature to try to force the secession, which leads Missouri to be one of, it leads Missouri to be the second most uh, they have the second most Civil War engagements. Uh, only Virginia had more Civil War engagements in the state. Missouri had a lot of battles fighting for who's going to, is it going to be a slave state? Is it going to be a free state? Is it going to be a Confederate state? Is it going to be a Union state? Uh, it, was a, it was a contentious issue. Uh, Kentucky was the same thing. There was a lot of battle, battles in Kentucky fighting for the allegiance of Kentucky. Um, Missouri and Kentucky, the South always felt that they could get them into their group, into the Confederacy. And so um, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of things about the Civil War we say, oh, it's about slavery. Well, the slavery is a very, very important issue in causing secession. It was a very important issue in the entire war. But the idea of the war being fought to free the slaves is a little misleading because the three slave states that stayed in the Union did not get rid of slavery until they were forced by the federal government in 1865 to do so um, by the amendment to the Constitution that outlaws slavery. The Emancipation Proclamation uh, given by Abraham Lincoln in 1862 only freed the slaves in the southern states, in the states that had rebelled against the United States. So the slaves in Missouri stayed slaves until after the war was all over. The slaves in Kentucky stayed slaves. No slaves were freed in the North during the Civil War. Uh, there were slaves in the North. There were slaves in Nebraska. Uh, and, and so the, the ideas that we hear today looking back are not always, always the way people saw things at the time. We have an amazing amount of information coming into our lives every minute. They had very little information coming, okay? And so you can very easily get misled and get caught up in in other situations. But then how does it affect the, it's, it's easy to talk about the Civil War from a big point of view, the big um, macro point of view, looking at every, you know, looking at battles and, and armies and generals. But for the individual guy, for the little guy, why do you end up fighting this war? Okay, because it's, it's the infantryman on the field with his rifle that's, that's fighting the war not a general sitting in his tent or on his horse behind the lines watching things from a mile away, okay? Why would a poor farmer from Arkansas take up arms against the Union, all right? Why would uh, a farmer from Minnesota pack up and head, you know, a thousand miles from home to go fight in foreign territory, okay, and, and fight this? And from that point of view, it gets really difficult to understand. Uh, it's really hard to really grasp that. Um, 
a town like Aurora, which, you know, this is a pretty good sized town for, you know, I mean, was about four, four or five thousand people. Okay? We'll try to put together a regiment. But if we put together a regiment out of Aurora, we take 20% of the population. The regiment is about a thousand guys. All right? A lot of towns would put together a company, about a hundred people would to sign up. And at the beginning of the war, they didn't think the war was going to last long. This is going to take long to sign up for nine months or a year. And then it'll be over, and then we can come home. And so these volunteer regiments start forming, both in the Confederacy and, and in, the, uh, in, the, in the Union. And they, and they form up these, one guy would take charge and say, hey, everybody come sign up. And that guy would end up being their officer because he's the guy that signed everybody up. They would elect their officers. If they didn't like how the guy was leading it, they would elect somebody else. They had re-elections of officers over and over again. Um, most officers aren't trained. They're just guys from your area. They're just somebody who took the initiative. If you can put together 10 companies, you can have a regiment. Then you get to be a colonel. Okay. Um, the 1st Nebraska Regiment was formed. It was how, many, how many Nebraska regiments total? Um, Two Nebraska regiments that were federalized. There was also uh, two scout companies of around 100 to 150 Pawnee Indians or Omaha Indians, and then there was a territorial militia that uh, was well, militia was basically, hey, there's trouble this way, <coughs> grab your guns and let's head out and take care of it. They weren't official. They didn't get paid for their service as far as I'm aware, but they were issued weapons and some uniforms by the government. The federal government. Yeah, the, the forming of companies in the North and the South is very different. Uh, the uniforms of the North and the South starting at the beginning of the war are all over the place. Uh, a lot of the groups that are formed up started off as little militia units, uh, kind of a little, uh, if there's trouble, we uh, will we'll join in and go put down the trouble. And they'd have They'd have their own uniforms. Sometimes they'd be gray, sometimes they'd be blue, sometimes they'd be green. They have just whatever their unit. You know, well, when the war first started, that's what they wore. Okay? And so uh, there were a lot of gray troops fighting for the Union in the first year of the war. And there were a lot of blue troops. actually wore gray when they marched off to, to St. Louis. Half the guys were wearing gray. First Nebraska. No. So, you know, it's, it's, it's we, we look back at it and we say, oh, it's blue and gray. Um, but it's, it's all over the place. We'll talk a little bit more about uniforms later. Uh, Aaron's going to talk a little bit about the first Nebraska and the first Nebraska's history. Uh, well, the first Nebraska was an infantry unit, and the color of infantry is light blue. That's why you see it on my, my collar here. Uh, halfway through the war, they were eventually converted to cavalry, um, fought bushwhackers, which were uh, more or less bandits that claimed one side or the other and would raid. Uh, Missouri and Arkansas, uh, and then by about 1863-1864, uh, uh, problems with the Indians out on, on the west, and the, I guess there's displays around here of the Pawnee. The Pawnee scouts are already out here trying to do what they could, um, but the first Nebraska was turned into cavalry and then brought back to uh, Nebraska. And the uh, second Nebraska was a cavalry regiment the entire time. But you mentioned uh, just uh, the, the fact that if you can raise a regiment, you'll be, you'll be in command of it. Uh, well, initially when uh, Nebraska got its call for arms, everybody, for every man, since only men were like allowed to fight anymore, uh, was exempt from it because it was a territory. No one could be drafted. No one could be forced to, to fight in Nebraska. Every every Civil War vet that fought in a Nebraska unit was a volunteer. And I'd have to recheck the numbers, but I've heard several times that if Nebraska was a state, it would have had the highest percentage of volunteers out of any Union state. It's, it's a mere 350 or 3,500 guys that that volunteered for the, the lowly territory of Nebraska, but them being all, all volunteers is, is pretty significant. And I think that kind of holds true today with uh, just the general patriotism, the appreciation of volunteers, and the appreciation of our services that I've always found in Nebraska. But uh, the, the first regiment, the first company, you'd have 
10 companies of around 100, and that would form your 1,000 men in your regiment. The first company was actually formed in Plattsmouth. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Robert Rodney Livingston was running a newspaper there in absence of his friend. Got a telegraph that said there's been firing on Fort Sumter and that Abraham Lincoln needs volunteers. Well, they're all exempt from, from any volunteer service, but he still felt it was his patriotic duty. And he had only moved to Nebraska probably 10 years before. He was actually born in Canada and educated there, but he had found Plattsmouth to be a nice town and set up a, a doctor's practice there. Did some other kind of random civic jobs and immediately began turning the local newspaper and recruiting posters. And by the end of the week, he had formed its, its first company. And Brownville, Nebraska City, and Omaha were kind of the major recruiting stations. There's actually two veterans that even came as far away as Hall County, which isn't really that far when we think about it, but that was as far west as you could go at, at the time. Uh, once they had uh, kind of formed up, it took about a month to form up, and they immediately went down to Missouri. Uh, through the course of the war, they fought in, in various skirmishes, but they did fight in the first couple major battles out here in the west, being Fort Donaldson, where they earned a reputation as very fierce fighters, and then at the bloody Battle of Shiloh, where they uh, were not there on the first day, but they arrived with their brigade the second day and kind of saved the Union's left front flank, being fresh troops and uh, well equipped. Uh, your unit that you represent is the 4th Arkansas, is that correct, sir? Yes. Were they at Shiloh? Or? No, 4th Arkansas was uh, formed at the very beginning of the war. They were formed in July of, uh, of 61, and uh, as soon as they formed up, they formed up in central Arkansas and started heading north because they heard that there was a big group of uh, soldiers looking to try to take Missouri for the south. And so they just started heading north. Um, in August, they, they finally met up with the Confederate forces right after the Battle of Wilson's Creek, which took place uh, near Springfield, um, Missouri. It was a Confederate victory. Um, it was uh, the first major battle um, in the Western Theater. Um, they just missed it. Um, then they marched around trying to um, negotiate the terrain and, and figure out what the, uh, the Union troops were doing. And uh, at the Battle of um, what's called Pea Ridge or Elkhorn Tavern, You'll notice that most Civil War battles have two names. Uh, they have a northern name and a southern name. Uh, the Battle of Pea Ridge is, uh, was take, took place near Bentonville, Arkansas, right near where Walmart was formed. Um, the uh, Confederates lose that battle. They, their top three commanders on the field all get killed in the first morning of fighting, and nobody knew who was in charge until the middle of the night um, before they got it all sorted out as to who was actually supposed to make decisions, and by then, Union lines have been reinforced, and uh, um, they largely had to get away. And that was the first battle for the Fourth Arkansas. They then went to, to uh, Little Rock, and were supposed to be meeting up with the uh, armies that would eventually fight at Shiloh, but they had no way to get there. Uh, they were waiting on transportation down the Arkansas River and up the Mississippi. And by the time the steamboats got there to move them all the way up there, the battle was over. And so then they fought the battle. Um, Farmington um, and Corinth in Mississippi, uh, which followed the uh, Battle of Shiloh. Um, what we, we we move around. You mentioned Paul County not being very far. Um, we move around. You know, oh, it's 15 miles. That's 15 minutes. That's nothing. Uh, but 15 miles is about as far as a person would probably travel in a day. Um, you force march troops maybe 30 miles, but you were really wearing them out. You have a hard time moving the next day. Most of the transportation was on your feet, on leather shoes, handmade, in a factory somewhere. And, and that's how you got there. Yeah, there was a lot of locomotive traffic for big movements, but daily you had to move. To have water for a thousand guys in your regiment, to have food enough for a thousand guys in your regiment every day. Uh, imagine a cavalry uh, regiment 
you have to have enough grass or grain to feed those horses every day. Think about how much water a thousand horses would drink, okay? We don't think about that daily camp of life as to how do you supply an army for four years? You know, what, what total number of soldiers served in, in the war, do you know? Uh, all sides, I think it's like two and a half million people wore the uniform of Oklahoma. And you know, you think about feeding an army like that, keeping, you know, where do you find fresh water? Where do you, you know, and so you do a lot of walking, a lot of, a lot of hoof, you know, using, using the old feet to travel around. Um, the 4th Arkansas, sorry, I talked about them a lot. I've done most of my reading on the 4th Arkansas, but um, right now, 150 years ago today, they were being transported to Kentucky to invade Kentucky and try to take Kentucky for the South. And, and once they got to Tennessee, they got off the trains because there were no railroads. They took them north from there. They had to walk across the Cumberland Gap. And they walked all the way up to the Ohio border, across the Ohio River from Ohio. They were getting newspapers from Cincinnati. They were capturing them. And they walked and walked. And they walked the whole thing. They, um, hundreds and hundreds of miles that they walked and then had to fight a battle. Uh, the Battle of uh, Richmond, Kentucky. They, they marched for 15 miles and then fought the Battle of Richmond. Um, so, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine walking 15 miles, wearing wool and everything you own with you. They didn't have a supply depot. They didn't have a camp to go back to. You carried the stuff with you. Uh, there was no supply coming, especially for Southern troops. There wasn't supply lines. There wasn't a place that's going to send you food. You're on your own. What you can find, what you can carry. And if you leave stuff somewhere, it's probably not going to be there if you ever even do get back there. And uh, so, uh, especially with Southern troops, you see a lot of disunity in the way they look. Um, uniforms get dirty, they get worn out. Imagine wearing the same set of clothes every day for a year. Um, it was usually over a year before they get issued any type of new uniform. Um, wearing it every day it's in, in the rain, in the mud, in the snow, in the heat. Your clothes will just fall apart right on you. Um, early war uniforms were usually frock coats. That's what uh, we're both wearing here as a frock coat. Um, mine's a little short, probably should be a little longer. Um, but a frock coat was the style of, of coat at the time. Um, most militia units prior to the war, the standard military army uniform before the war was, was a frock coat. Uh, usually had nine buttons, went down about to your knees. And uh, you can imagine it. Get a whole unit of those guys, they look pretty sharp. But the thing is, it takes a lot of wool. And you hear a lot of stuff about wool uniforms. Why would you wear wool uniforms? The United States Army used wool uniforms up until uh, up, up into World War II. Uh, was, you know, they would use wool, wool uniforms. Wool is is warm when it's wet. Even when it's soaking wet, wool's warm. Uh, wool doesn't burn. It kind of smolders, but it doesn't burn. So if you're too close to the campfire wearing cotton, your clothes can start on fire. But wool, yeah, you get little burn marks, but it won't start on fire. It's, it's, a, and it's and the heaviness of it, you know, you can stop uh, the point of a bayonet, maybe. Okay? Um, there's, there's, there's a lot of benefits to wool. Um, the, the sources of wool for uniforms is, is different. You'll find some uniforms turn kind of purple as they faded in the sun. Um, some turn kind of, kind of gray, uh, depending on where they're uh, issued from. Uh, Union uniforms were the dark blue that we know, but the, the light blue pants, um, there were also dark blue pants or red pants. Pants were a, a place where they could uh, have a little uh, connection for their unit. Same with headgear. Um, what do you know about your headgear? Uh, it's a lot more convenient than that short brim you have on, <laughs> on your hat. Um, this has actually seen some pretty hard use. It actually, instead of being rounded on the top, it would be flat on the top and look uh, more like Abe Lincoln's signature top hat, and then it'd be folded up on the top and have a big feather sticking out of it. That's pretty useless. So early on, guys would pull that stuff out of their, their uniform, and he mentioned uh, dark blue pants. Once the first Nebraska got to uh, St. Louis, they were issued uniforms like I'm wearing, and instead of these light blue pants, they wore dark blue pants. 
the only uh, photographic evidence we really have of the first Nebraska would be uh, dressed as I described with a feather in their hat and the, the sign put up and there'd be a uh, metal insignia with an eagle and then in its talons it has a shield with 13 stars. I decided to take that out of my hat and make it more practical, especially since it's all beat up now. That's called a Hardy hat, right? Uh, yeah, and Hardy was actually, uh, uh, he became a, a Confederate general at, at some point, so. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting one. Hardy's infantry tactics is the uh, standard drill of Civil War soldiers, and it's written by uh, who would become General Hardy, who's a colonel, I think, when he wrote it. And the hat was adopted as part of his uniform regulations that he presented, and it got accepted. And then he becomes a uh, Southern General. Um, Sometimes it's called the uh, Davis hat, and the shoes are actually called uh, Jeff Davis Brogans, Jefferson Davis being the Secretary of War shortly before At the Civil War broke out. When the Civil War breaks out, he happens to be the President of the Confederacy. So it, it really is Americans fighting Americans. It's, it's very intertwined, not just <coughs> the culture, but even the equipment and the, and the clothing people wear. Um, Confederate uniforms, uh, what I'm wearing, this is made out of what's called jean wool. It's half cotton and half um, wool. The, the uh, strings going one direction are made out of cotton, and then they put the weave the wool into it the other direction. Uh, the South had cotton. And so um, by doing that, uh, they were able to use um, the cotton they couldn't get out of their ports because they'd been blockaded by the Northern Navy. They couldn't sell the cotton anywhere, which made Egyptian cotton very, very profitable. Egypt did well because nobody could get American cotton during the Civil War. Um, but uh, Gene Wool's actually, it, it, it's really rough. It feels like uh, almost like burlap or even rougher, but it does breathe better than, than just all wool because of that cotton. That cotton wicks away some of that moisture and, and it actually uh, dries faster. Uh, we have some uniforms after we're finished here. You can feel free to come and look at some of our equipment. Um, I, we have different types of uniforms. The frock coats uh, were largely impractical over time. This is a lot of wasted material down here from the ways down. It takes a lot more material to make than you're outfitting an army of millions and you have to put this skirt on every coat. Um, it's one of my contentions that the South lost the war because they kept putting nine buttons on everything. And the, Union went to five, four buttons on their coats and they didn't have to waste money making buttons. Uh, the, uh, the Union uniform eventually turns to a sack coat. Let me grab that sack coat from underneath that bumper number. The standard uni Union volunteers, um, after the first year of the war, wore a four button sack coat. Um, the four button sack coat becomes the standard for Union soldiers. If you went to church this morning, you might have seen a throwback to the remnants of that. Um, I did at church this morning. The blue blazer with the brass buttons comes from, from that. Um, a lot of times these soldiers came home, they, they joined the GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic, which was the veterans organization at the time. And they would keep getting their uniforms re-tailored and remade, and they had to, and that would usually be the nicest coat they had, was their GAR coat, and they'd wear it to church. And it'd be the blue blade, and it'd be a blue coat, with four buttons, and and then they'd start putting the buttons on the cuffs, and, and they'd fold down the lapels, and, and, it, and that's why blue blazers with brass buttons are so common in America today. It's because they're a throwback to the to the uniforms of the Civil War, um, the, the the suits before the standard style of suits in the United States, especially in the South, was the frock coat frock coat design. Um, it dies out in the American West in the 1880s. Uh, you, see, you, know, you see old pictures of cowboys wearing those frock coats. But the sack coat suit we still wear today. Uh, suit coats today are still based on that sack coat design. They're cheaper and easier to make. Uh, the South Berry didn't make a lot of sack coats. What they did is they made these without the skirt, and they're called a shell jacket. Um, they were made in different, different places made of them, so there's lots of different styles. Um, to dye things gray, what do you use to dye things gray? We have to get dye from India. There was no way to get dye in the United States. So as the war goes on, they have to come up with different ways to dye things, um, different roots. Uh, uh, black walnut trees, those awful walnuts you get in your, on your driveway, they stain your, your driveway. 
Um, they would use that as dye to dye their, their clothes. It would start off a pretty good gray, but as it bleaches out in the sun, it turns brown, and then it turns tan. Uh, and so what you end up with is, is units of Confederates, especially late in the war, all sorts of colors of browns and grays. Uh, they call them butternut, uh, as well, you know, a lot of times they're called but line of butternut or butternut infantry, and, and it was because that, the, that gray would fade because they didn't have good dyes. And so it's kind of interesting. Um, you look at them in museums today, and they all look almost greenish. It's because over time they, they change colors, whereas the blues stay pretty blue. Um, the indigo berries are pretty strong. Yeah. So, would you like to talk about weapons? Uh, sure. Why don't I will show whatever you want if you want to talk about it. <laughs> Number one weapon of the soldier is the musket. Uh, this is an 1861 Springfield musket. 60, uh, 61 um, was the year that they modified the previous version, which was the 55 Springfield, which they only made 7,000 of. And it's funny because there's over 70,000 replicas of them made today. There's only 7,000 originals. Um, early in the war, people fought with whatever they had. Um, units usually didn't get issued arms um, when they formed up. There weren't enough guns to be had, so guys would bring their hunting rifles with them. Uh, yours is a uh, this is a smoothbore uh, 42 Springfield. It's basically almost identical to the same kind of weapons used even up to the Revolution, with the exception of the uh, the lock plate here. Instead of being a flint lock like they used in the Revolution, the 42. Uh, 1842 model, that was the first mass produced uh, cap lock. So this would have been, uh, well, by the time of the Civil War, this would have been kind of an older weapon, but a lot of units, both north and south, and including the first Nebraska, which is why I found myself a replica, um, used a weapon like this. But it is a larger caliber, it is a .69 caliber, where that is a .58. Uh, his, his rifle, mine is not, and part of the reason is rifling is expensive. Um, the other reason is the standard military load was uh, what is called buck and ball, which is one ball of 6.9 caliber and then three to eight pieces of buck shot. So this would essentially be a, a very accurate shot, an accurate maybe to a thousand yards at best. And given smoke on a battlefield, it still was fairly useful. Uh, of course, the, the rifled weapon was, was definitely superior, and by the end of the war, they were not making weapons like this and trying to make uh, the Model 61 and Model 1863 simplifying manufacturing, making it uh, cheaper to produce, simpler to clean, and also trying to get rid of any old ammunition stock that these earlier weapons would have had. Uh, a lot of militia units had 69 caliber smoothbore. The 42 Springfields have been around for almost 20 years. They were the standard. Uh, the 55 Springfields never caught on real well. Um, people weren't well accepted. They were a 58 caliber. Um, they, they didn't stick around very long. At the onset of the Civil War, the 61 uh, comes out simplifying that 55 model. And later on, they do the 63 twice because they screw up the first model and it makes it worse. And then they fix it and make it better, as all government programs seem to do. Um, they, they're heavy. They weigh about 10 pounds. You can shoot once without having to reload. Um, how you handle this on the battlefield, this, is, this keeps you, this is why you're there. Uh, it's the most important thing you have with you. Um, you uh, have cartridges preloaded usually come from an arsenal, probably loaded by uh, civilian workers. A lot of times uh, uh, women had jobs working rolling, rolling rounds. It would be a roll of paper, rolled around a bullet, uh, then filled with the right amount of powder, and then folded up shut, and put into groups of 10. Do I have a group of 10? Yeah, you can show over there. And uh, that's actually got many balls in it, so it's full. Fully. I don't think it's heavy. Yeah, it's kind of heavy. Um, a full box ammunition weighs about 80 pounds. Um, and so that's got some weight to it. All right? And the guy would carry 40 uh, rounds. So they'd carry four of these in your cartridge box. It's built to carry four, four pouches. Like now, 40 rounds seems like a lot. But in the heat of battle, 40 rounds isn't going to last you a whole long time. Uh, you're going to spend more time 
reloading and you're going to spend um, worrying about anything else. 40 rounds isn't going to last in, in a big battle. And a lot, of, a lot of soldiers would run out of ammunition. Also, in the heat of battle, you get kind of scared and you get uh, confused and, and noise gets loud. And, and there's, there's cases where soldiers would just keep loading and never fire. They just keep loading and loading and loading. And there'd be eight or ten rounds pounding inside their barrel. Uh, it's it's the heat of battle. There would be weapons found, but they x-ray and see all the rounds that are packed in there. You definitely wouldn't want to shoot it down. Uh, people like to kind of assume that it takes, oh, you know, these old muzzle-loading muskets. It takes a minute to load these. Uh, a well-trained man. 20 to 15 seconds is how long it takes to load it. So you're shooting three or four times in a minute, not once every one or two minutes, which doesn't sound like that long, but it really is an eternity when there are tens of thousands of other people trying to kill you. 15 seconds can be a very long time. You know, your regiment would be a thousand guys lined up in two rows of 500. Uh, each company would be two rows of 50 guys, elbow to elbow. Imagine 500 of us. We're going to be a heck of a line. And that's just one regiment. A division would be three or even four regiments together. A brigade, I mean, a brigade would be several regiments put together. A division would be several brigades put together. Uh, when we start talking about a corps, you're talking about a lot of muskets being put on target. And you're largely shooting blind, because after the first round of, of fire, the smoke created by black powder is blinding you, you just it just hangs there in the air unless you have a good breeze. You don't see where you're shooting anymore. You're just shooting downrange, uh, which is which is <coughs> the essence of Napoleonic tactics, which were the rule of the day. To load one of these, you'd be given the, the command to load. You get your round, you bite the end off, you pour the powder down the barrel. The bullet would be right in here, the mini ball. Voted to secede and become their own country. 
just like the Founding Fathers did when they wrote the Declaration of Independence and sent it to uh, King George. They chose to leave. And we expected it. And we, we studied, you know, we had the Fourth of July celebrations, and you read this Declaration of Independence, it says right in there that if your government becomes tyrannical, it's your job to stand up against it and stop it and change it. What were the southern states doing? They were seeing their government as tyrannical, and they were going to stand up and change it. When that didn't work, they voted to leave. What did we learn as a result of the Civil War? States don't have a right to leave. So in a lot of ways, all Americans are more subservient to the state now than, than they were before. Even though the slaves are freed, you don't have a right as a state to leave. You don't have a right as a group to leave the country. You leave as an individual, but not as a group. You can't leave. The federal government has priority. You know, the whole idea of a big government that the South is afraid of exists today. So they didn't, they didn't achieve it. Sorry, went on a rant. That's, that's okay. I did that. And, and unless you're voted out by the other states, a two thirds majority will vote out of the state. But who can actually see that happening, I guess? The, the, the Constitution of the United States recognizes slavery. The United States, the, the flag of the United States stood for a slave holding country for um, better than 60, 70, 80 years. Um, the Confederate flag that most people think of as the Confederate flag um, never stood for slavery. Um, in fact, the Confederate flag that most people think of was never the Confederate flag at all. Hold this one out. Yeah, that'd be great. This is this. actually what he's talking about. I'll pull it up. It does look like an American flag, but you can see the three stripes and then the field. This is the first national flag of the Confederacy. This is an 11-star version of the first national flag of the Confederacy. It was the flag of the Confederate uh, States of America until uh, mid-1863. So for the first two full years of the war, that was the Confederate flag. It was only after that that they decided they needed to change it because it, on the battlefield it looks too much like the American flag. It looks too much like, and so it's hard to tell lines. Flags are really important to, to the battlefield. Uh, in Napoleonic tactics in that time period. You don't have cell phones where you can call your, your commander and say, hey, where are you guys at? You fall down on the battlefield, and by the time you get up, you don't know where your troops are. You go running off into the trees, and your group's reforming, you don't know where your unit is. You have to recognize the flag of your unit, and that's how you line up. From one end of a row of 500 guys to the other end, you don't hear commands. In a battle, you're hearing loud booms and sounds that you don't, you don't your ears start ringing and you don't hear anything. Um, you gotta know where to be. And so unit flags are even more important than even national flags. And the, the flag that is considered the Confederate flag today, um, and is, has largely in the last few years been really turned into a symbol of, of in some people's opinions, racism, was, is based on the flag of the Army of Northern Virginia, which was a square version of that flag. Um, but it was never so, uh, star flag. Yes, I have a long This was also considered a flag of the Confederacy. Um, this was actually this is called a Bonnie Blue flag. Um, when Florida declared its independence before it became a state, before it became part of the United States, it had been part of Spain, and they broke away from Spain, and this was their flag was blue with a white star. Uh, when they joined the Confederacy, when they seceded from the United States, they went back to this. And a bunch of Texas units took it up as well as, as the symbol of, we're our own state. We're the only thing. We're our own state. We're not a group of states. We're our own. And so it became um, a symbol of, of, of the Confederacy. It was a wonderful song, pretty popular in uh, South Carolina for secessionist rallies leading up to the Civil War. They saw that as a symbol. And this, that the, the single star flag and this one over here really more represent the true history and true heritage of the Southern Confederacy. And in, in recent times, what we think of as the Confederate flag is really the battle flag of Northern Virginia. That, that's part of the, the, the skewing and modernization of, of the Civil War. It, it's a more familiar symbol, but the flag he held and I held are, are actually more historically correct. And, and it, 
to someone who knows that, it becomes very interesting to watch popular culture villainize that Army of Northern Virginia flag and in the meantime, close their eyes to the true history. That flag right there is the first flag of the Confederacy. If a war was fought strictly over slavery, then that flag stands for slavery. Uh, the flag of the Army of Northern Virginia stood for the Army of Northern Virginia. It was their, their unit flag. This is the flag of the Fourth Arkansas. This is the unit flag. The flag of the Army of Northern Virginia was theirs, okay? But today, we see that as, as a symbol of racism, a symbol of slavery, whereas the United States flag stood for slavery for a lot longer. And this flag over here, people don't know. This is the actual stars and bars. The stars and bars that you see, is, it, that's, not, that's not what that was called. This was called the stars and bars. Uh, the flag of the Army of Northern Virginia is what's been turned into it. Um, a few years ago, Georgia had a, a huge argument over their state flag, having the Confederate flag as a part of their flag. And it had part of that Army of Northern Virginia, that part of that Confederate imagery as part of their flag. And so they voted to get rid of it and come up with a new flag. But nobody liked the new flag. So then they voted again, and they had it up to this vote. And if you see the flag of Georgia today, you're going to see that minus the middle star, instead it has a little building in the middle of the star. But the flag of Georgia is essentially exactly that flag today because of a politically driven idea to get rid of that symbol of the Confederacy. They ended up taking on the symbol of the true Confederacy because they were so caught up in political correctness. And people don't know that today. People see it and they go, that Mississippi flag has that Confederate flag in it. That's bad. The Georgia flag is truly the Confederate flag. Minus one star, and it has a building in the middle instead of that star. Otherwise, it's exactly the same thing. And so it, it shows how today we skew things and we change things and we look at it from, oh, it's 150 years ago. You know, it's, it was about slavery, it's all over. You know, um, there's a lot more to the Civil War than that. Um, as I said, this is the flag of Fourth Arkansas. Uh, anybody familiar with this design? I think it's Scotsman in here. Scottish heritage. This is the Scottish flag with a white border around it. Uh, the, the commander of the 4th Arkansas was a guy by the name of McNair. Uh, he was a Scotsman. Um, and uh, and uh, they uh, served under uh, a guy by the name of McCown, who was also a Scotsman. And all of McCown's, all of his uh, regiments had a version of this flag so that you could tell their division from other divisions. They all had that. Hardy's division was the same blue with a big circle in it. You could tell that we were in the right division by looking over here. Uh, there was a North Carolina unit in the division with them that had red triangles in the corners of this flag. It was the same that had red triangles and had a big 39th North Carolina on it. And that's how you told where you were on the, on the battlefield. And this is what you fought for. Letting this fall into the hands of the enemy was, was the worst thing that could happen. You don't let your flag fall into the arms of the enemy. That's the same thing you've given up. You didn't really care about that flag falling in the arms of the enemy. You don't let your regimental colors fall into the hands of the enemy. And this is what they fought for. And they would smuggle these out. They would smuggle these into the prisoner war camps so that they didn't fall into the hands of the enemy. It's just trying to get them back home. Um, a lot of the southern flags are lost because they're lost. Okay. They got them taken away from them. Um, but those flags are really important. And, and um, it's, it's just interesting to see how it's been transformed by popular culture into being things that it never stood for. Now, we're kind of winding up. We're not going to tell the whole story of the Civil War and, and all the battles that expect. You can read about that. Um, the fact of the matter is, for an everyday infantry soldier, north or south, you might fight a couple days a year. You might fight over the course of an entire four years, even if you served the whole four years. You might, you might fight in battles for a total of two weeks of it. So what did you do with the rest of the time? You fight in three major battles in a year. But what did you do all that the rest of that time? You don't go home. You don't go to a hotel. They're camping somewhere. They're living somewhere. And, and camp life is, is monotonous. And boring, and it was life. You would, you would, you were. If you were in army for the whole war, uh, the Fourth Arkansas was was formed in, in July of '61. 
Uh, they were captured in April of 64, I mean 65, and disbanded. Only 14 guys from the 4th Arkansas ever went home, ever made it back to Arkansas. 14 guys. Um, that's insane. Now, a lot of those guys got captured and then just never came back to Arkansas. There was nothing for them there. Changed their names and go try to homestead in Nebraska. Um, things like that. Um, but they just never made it home. They were just gone. Um, and, and, and we think about battles and we see things like uh, Gettysburg and, we, and gods and generals and, and glory and watch these movies and these big battles. But the majority of their time was sitting around their tent cleaning their musket. Uh, these muskets are, are these Springfields are armory bright, which means they're not blue. Um, they rust. It rains. It's dewy in the morning. They rust. Mine's um, actually quite a bit warm. Yours is much more rusty. Weather worn, and there's armory bright, but then there's armory brown too, which is a controlled rusting <coughs> weapon, which I'm trying to let mine happen. That clean is just not something I think I can attain. But in camp life, you do have it have that much time. You can only polish buttons in the weapons so often. Things like drinking were a major, major problem in the Civil War. The first Nebraska certainly had a terrible reputation. It was uh, fierce fighters, but terrible drunks when they were in camp. So. Well, in cleaning these weapons, you clean them with water. Um, you clean black powder out of these with water. Uh, water and metal, as we all know, are recipe for rust. Um, it rust is the enemy. Um, the black powder residue after you fire black powder, very corrosive. Uh, you have to wash it out right away or you destroy the rifling inside your barrel. It's very important that you pour water down it. And in, if you put oil, if the gun oil that we use today in guns to clean guns and things like that, that mixes with black powder and black powder will burn. Um, so then it causes your gun to foul. So you can't use a lot of oil or any. And so keeping them functional <coughs> would be a very important thing for you to do. Um, and they're going to rust constantly. I don't care about my buttons, because they don't, they'll stay functional even if they turn black. But, but if, this, if this weapon gets rusty and doesn't work, I'm in trouble. So what do you do around camp? We, we clean our muskets, we drink, we play cards, we um, sit around the fire, we cook. Um, union guys, a lot of times they would have supply trains that would bring them big A-frame tents and, and cook, cooking tents, and they've got guys that all they do is cook for them, and then just go get in the chow line. Um, the Confederacy very seldom had that. Every four to eight guys would group together, put their tents together, and they'd, they'd cook together and, and cook what you could find. Um, the North was issued things like hardtack, which is, a, which is a flour and water baked so that it's hard, uh, called them tooth dullers. They're very hard. Um, and they keep for a long time. They don't, there's nothing in them to spoil. Um, bugs can get in them, but they don't spoil. Uh, and so they'll last a long time. Um, but there's not a whole lot of nutritional value. It's basically a big saltine without the salt. How old is that? A year. I think about once a year. Um, the, the southern soldiers didn't eat hardtack because they didn't have any bakeries to make it to bring it to them. They would usually get given cornmeal, or they'd just find stuff on, on on the road. Uh, if you find corn, like right now, you find lots of corn in fields you can eat, you know. Maybe it's not quite right, but you know, you can eat it. Um, they would then take it, if, if they were going to be leaving an area where they might have it, they'd take that corn and put those cobs down in the ashes, and that corn would dry up and get real hard. Then you put it in your powder sack, this nice sack here, it's for your food. Um, put, put that dried corn in there, and then, then you know, that won't go bad, and then you can eat that later. Hard on the teeth, but um, it's nutrition. Um, so parched corn. Um, if you got some meat, you'd be lucky. There wasn't a lot of meat. Um, you didn't eat well in, in the army. A lot of people got sick. More people died of being sick uh, during the Civil War than died of battlefield wounds. That food, um, you mentioned not being able to find water. That was you, you could find water, but you don't know that downstream there could be Confederates that were bathing in it, and that just washes down and you know, around the bend there's some water. cab units over there and they're almost just yeah. the horse could have just walked you know um, past it and you know we could go turn on the closet we expect that water to be clean um, you, if you read civil war diaries you listen to the, these guys will write about how the water tasted oh yeah the water there was really weedy or the water there tasted really mossy or it was sweet or right, a metallic know. taste yeah right. and they did talk about how the water tasted you know we, you know even omaha drink that omaha water we talked about omaha <laughs> <laughs> 
you know, it doesn't taste like that good Nebraska water everywhere else. Like, you know, imagine that everywhere. You're going down to the river, it might taste like flat river water. That doesn't taste like Cedar River water. Um, um, it's, 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 it's amazing to look at that and say, and guess what? <laughs> Lots of them got sick. They got dysentery. A lot of them were sick all the time. And you're marching, and you're not getting any nutrition. You're eating dried bread and the occasional piece of bacon. And then you're going to go walk for 20 miles. It's, it's a time of, of history that people don't realize this, but your cause of death could actually be listed as diarrhea. It was that, that common to get sick. More people died from a disease than wounds. Um, this tent is called a dog tent. Um, it's, it's made of two halves. Um, most Civil War tents, you know, most dog tents wouldn't have an end piece in it. Um, they would just be two pieces of canvas. He'd carry a piece, and his buddy would carry a piece. Everybody carried one half of it. And then when you got to a place where you could camp, you could either take yours, hang it from a tree or something, make yourself some kind of a lean-to, or two guys get together, you put layers together on the top, find a couple of sticks, and make a tent. You carry those with you, it doesn't carry a lot. It doesn't, it doesn't weigh a lot, um, but they get rid of them too. It, they're heavy. Um, heavy, anything you didn't actually need. And they would go to having everything they need wrapped up inside their blanket. This is just a bedroll. It's just uh, you know, a, pair of, another pair of socks and uh, a shirt and, and my blanket. That's, that's, that's really all I need. Because it's gonna rain, I'm gonna get wet anyway. This thing or not, I'm still gonna get wet, so I might as well just get soaked. Um, and the less stuff you have to carry, because nobody's gonna help me carry my stuff. And you gotta carry everything with you. And that's day to day, every day. Um, and as reenactors, um, some reenactors do this more in that way than others. Um, some show up with a pickup truck full of their stuff, unload, and they have great big tents, and they have big cooking equipment, and they have all this stuff. And some guys, you know, park a mile away and hoof it in with just barely anything. Um, and there's all ranges in between. No two Civil War reenacting units are the same. Um, and it, it's, it, it's, I think it's really eye-opening to, to try to live that way. To say, okay, for a week, I'm going to carry what I, everything I need on my back. Yeah, you can live that way. You try to get a sense of that. And I think that's what we kind of try to do, is try to recapture that time period and, and, and live um, in that way to try to show people um, what that was like. We're inside in air conditioning today. We really should be doing this outside in the sun. Like three days ago, it was like 100 degrees. <laughs> you know, um, wearing layers of wool with our wool hats on. Because that's the way they would like for the bit. Do you have anything else you want to talk about? Do some uh, uh, yeah, I guess we can answer, answer questions. Mm -hmm. Get my spiel on the first of us a little bit. I think we have a gentleman here with a question. In, in a react, reenactment, is it both Confederate and Union? And what do you do? Is there battles? Or is it just one side and in, in, in reenactment? Or how does that work? Is it spectator friendly? Usually, uh, most of them are put together to be spectator friendly. Um, one of the reasons is the group I'm in even exists is because there was the First Nebraska. And there's a group now that's called the First Nebraska. Um, it's based out of Omaha. Uh, Lincoln, Omaha. I'm actually from Kearney. There's a group of guys from Kearney and Fort Wayne are part of the First Nebraska. And then there's the uh, in Fremont. There's the Fremont Pathfinders, and they're also a union group. Um, there's, there's lots of union groups around. There are a lot of Confederate groups around, and so when they try to do a reenactment, you need to have somebody to fight against. And so then guys would do what they call galvanizing, which is where you have to take some of those Union guys and have them dress up as Confederate guys. Um, and galvanizing actually is a, a period term, uh, and what, what galvanized uh, Yankees really were were Confederates that had been prisoners, and then they had. To get out of the prison camps, they had volunteered to fight Indians out on the prairie. So actually at Fort Kearney there were these uh, galvanized Yankees. I think sometimes they're called galvanized Confederates today, but that's really not quite true. Uh, but Confederate soldiers that then changed sides after they had been captured uh, in order to get out of prison camp, they had to vow not to take up arms against. Uh, they couldn't go back and fight in the South. But they get special special treatment or allowed out early if they 
agree to sign up and go out to some western outposts like Fort Kearney um, and serve, serve there out of the way. You know, we can trust you because you're not fighting against your friends over there. You're, you're protecting the land against Indians or whatever. But, uh, but yeah, we would always try to have um, both sides. Some, some reenactments are bigger than others. I uh, went to one a few weeks ago in Missouri, and there were there were 100 guys on a side. Um, uh, whereas if you go to like a national reenactment, like he went to Shiloh, what were their total numbers there? The uh, biggest number I heard was 7,000. Mm -hmm. And really at an event that size, you do get a sense of the numbers of people. Um, you're talking about smoke blinding you. I can remember one instance where we were waiting in the morning, it's probably six, seven o'clock in the morning, till like 10 in the morning, and the smoke was so thick that if you could imagine this room, instead of walls, it would be smoke and mist. You couldn't see beyond that. And the sun was just this dim, bloody red ball in the sky. You could look right at it, it was so, so dim. There wasn't a cloud in the sky, but just the hanging smoke, hanging with the, the mist, really kind of blind you. So if you get a chance to go to a larger reenactment, I encourage you to do so. <coughs> Smaller stuff around the state is fun. We get a chance to talk to you guys to really get a sense of it. Probably the large national events, at least from a spectator's point of view, would probably be better than you say. Right. Problem is, is there aren't a lot of them out here. Um, Battle of Wilson's Creek, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there was a reenactment of that last fall, uh, last August right around the 150th anniversary of it. Um, there were over 40,000 spectators that came out over three days to watch the battle. Uh, we had over 3,000 reenactors on the side. We had over 100 cannons on the side. We had over 200 horses per side in cavalry. Um, and your line after line and after line of soldiers marching across the battlefield. And this group fires and fires and fires, and then they open up and let the next group through. And you see how those lines move across the battlefield, and you can't hear, and you listen, you've got your elbows next to the next guy, and, then, and you're just trying to stay together. Um, and then off in the distance, you see these lines of people watching. <laughs> it's, it's, it, it's a great spectator experience. The problem is, is that's the closest there's going to be a real national anywhere here. Um, next big national will be is, is this fall in uh, Vicksburg. They're doing the 49th anniversary of the fall of Vicksburg. And the Battle of Brandy will be in October um, down in Vicksburg, Mississippi. And that's not close. The weekend of the 6th of October. I think so. If anyone's interested in going down there, around here, uh, there, there aren't a whole lot. There was, I don't know if anyone went to one in Sutton last week. There was a little reenactment over there. Uh, there's one up in Pipestone, Minnesota, here in a few weeks that's going to be pretty big. I know there's hundreds of guys lined up to go. There's one in Lamoni, Iowa, uh, Labor Day weekend uh, every year. Um, and then they have a pretty good showing there. So if you ever wanted to see one with a good number of soldiers to really get a sense of it and the smell of it and the sounds of it, and those cannons go off one after another after another, it's like thunderbolt and it's really uh, interesting. So you got to hand up there if you have a question. The cannons are interesting. You haven't mentioned them, but like the Nebraska, I, I'm just assuming there weren't a lot of cannons here prior to the need for them in the war. Now, where did they all go? Did they do a lot of fighting in these groups without cannons until they got to the more eastern area? Right. Just getting the cannons. Artillery units were, were not prevalent in, the, in, in Nebraska. And even in Iowa, there are, I think at uh, one point the most that would ever be, uh, I say in the state, but it was a territory at the time, maybe 10, two or three over at uh, Fort Kearney, maybe, maybe six <laughs> in Fort Kearney, and then one or two in Omaha. Uh, I think there was a militia battery in Nebraska City that had a couple cannons, and that was, that was it. You really didn't need them. Well, and they think they had over fighting in the Indians. And, uh, they, they just up to that point there was no use for them out here, so they, they primarily were at Fort Kearney. Uh, and, and they're heavy and they're hard to move, and so they, they stayed pretty close to, you know, I mean, there were a lot in, in St. Louis. Most of the uh, uh, St. Louis and um, uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, the arsenals there, those cannons were the primary cannons of the Western Theater because uh, they were close to the battlefields to start off with. But largely, um, guys on horses, if you were living out, out in this part of, this, of Nebraska, you either walk somewhere or you rode a horse. So,
cavalry units and uh, infantry units would be largely what would be formed out of areas like this because if you've got legs and arms, you can walk and carry a musket, you're an infantry man. We need more of you than anybody else in anyway. Cavalry gets this wonderful, awe-inspiring cavalier uh, look and everybody's like, oh yeah, the cavalry soldiers are so Saber in one hand and the pistol another. Yeah, uh, they're cool. You but get the vast majority of customers out there that you, you think will be for which the anniversary was two weeks ago, three weeks ago. But the, just charging in, swinging your saber, and shooting your pistol, that's really not what the cavalry did either. That's not what uh, the first or second Nebraska did. In fact, I brought my saber just so people could look at it, but they left them, they left them at the fort where they were actually pawned some of them off. And a lot of the guys would actually carry larger muskets like this, not because it was more comfortable on a horse, but because they were out in the middle of nowhere and they were pretty poorly equipped. So the, the image of, of the hard charging calories is, is really Hollywood. It makes for a great movie, but I really can't think of a, a lot of instances where that really, really happened. Right? It was more of a Napoleonic um, entity, um, the way that the cavalry was used during the Napoleonic era in the early 1800s. Um, the cavalry would try to turn the flank, and it was, if a, an army turned and ran, the cavalry would go in and just decimate them. And that's where you get the you know, heart charging with your sword and because and, and you're attacking and treating soldiers that are running away. Um, it's really an action. Yeah, really often they're shooting people in the back. That's, yeah, I mean, you come up behind the bed, you know, it, by the time of really accurate weapons, um, you know, at 1,000 yards, an accurate weapon at 1,000 yards, if you're fighting with a sword and a pistol that's only good for about 50 or 60 yards, um, it's, it's, you're not going to fight a lot of battles that way. Uh, in the, the ca cavalry was most used during the Civil War as, as, uh, um, as the eyes of the army. Find out where the enemy is. They can move quickly and find out where those are. As far as actually fighting in battle, when they actually had the fight in battle, they had one guy hold four horses, and the other three guys went and fought like infantrymen. Um, while the guy held the horses back behind. They didn't usually fight from um, horseback in a dec decisive manner. So, you have a question, young lady? And what, how many weapons did, did each person have? Uh, an infantry man would probably have this. And this 10 pounds is enough. It's 12 pounds. Here's four. Yeah, here's just a little bit here. Um, you know, the, sometimes they carry a knife, uh, but largely they throw those away after a while because they just got to be cumbersome and you didn't use them. With your weapon, you'd have this until you ran out of ammunition or until you got too close at which point you'd use what is called a bayonet, which is very seldom used during the Civil War. You didn't usually get too many opportunities to have true bayonet charges. Um, again, a throwback to the Napoleonic tactics, but the idea of getting up close and stabbing your enemy with the pokey end is, uh, uh, it wasn't very common, but you could call this a weapon. So there'd be two. Um, cavalry soldiers would usually, they'd have a pistol, a carbine, Maybe a sword. Carving is just a short down. It's like this long. It's just a short, basically. But some of them, uh, you're so assuming everyone's familiar with like the, the, the Winchester rifle, the, the classic lever action Winchester. A very small amounts weapons like that are starting to be used in the Civil War, but that right there is your, your primary weapon. And this you can get weapon, you can get ammunition for this, you know. Uh, and this is the mass, this is the most common weapon in the Civil War was the spring, the 61 Springfield. The Springfield was the most commonly issued weapon, followed by the Enfield, which was made in England. Uh, both Union and um, Confederate troops were given Enfields. Slightly different caliber, but they could force the ammunition into both, um, which led to a few problems, but not too many. But this is the vast majority. You were on the battlefield, I can go through everybody's ammunition box that they've dropped it or they're laying there dying and I can go through and I can take out your ammunition and it'll match. If I start using a Winchester like hanging on the wall over there or uh, a shotgun or something, where am I going to get ammunition on that? Um, Southern troops a lot of times would pick up weapons because they never got issued weapons. Um, the 4th Arkansas never was issued weapons and they captured 5,000 weapons at the uh, Battle of Richmond, Kentucky, and then they got issued weapons that they had collected off the battlefield. And that's the only time they were given weapons throughout the war. And so, yeah, so that would be what you'd have. 
Questions here? Um, you're both representing different regiments, like near the 4th uh, Arkansas and the 1st Nebraska, I'm assuming over there. Mm -hmm. And it just struck me as to how specific that is when you're coming to do an exhibition of uh, Civil War. And I was just wondering, did you choose that on your own? And so why, why did you choose those specific regiments to, to display? Do you want to answer first, or do you want me to? Well, um, our unit was formed, I'm a member of the group, we have about 20 some guys, and we're the 4th Arkansas. When we go to a, a, a reenactment, we try to go together and serve together. We have our uniforms based on research we've done as to what the 4th Arkansas's uniforms would be. Uh, we chose the 4th Arkansas kind of at random. We wanted to find a Western theater unit that served throughout the whole world and stayed as themselves. They kept their name and came across the 4th Arkansas and since have found two books written by people who served with the 4th Arkansas about their day-to-day -day activities. So we have a lot of research information, first-hand information on what we did, what we wore, and things like that. The 1st Nebraska uh, is a group here in Nebraska. It's been around for quite a while. Uh, yeah, I think the, the original uh, the, the original group of reenactors for the 3rd, 1st Nebraska, actually started in 1970. So it's a pretty old uh, reenacting regiment. Why I personally picked it, um, it is really, like I kind of mentioned before, uh, Nebraska does tend to take better care and respect its veterans a lot more, but I noticed there weren't a lot of people that even knew that Nebraska fought in the Civil War, and I didn't want Nebraska's first veterans, which uh, you, you generally think too of uh, regiments and society being segregated, but uh, reminding people that uh, there were Native Americans that fought with the first Nebraska. Um, Nebraska's first African American veteran was with the first Nebraska also, and I wanted to make sure that um, Nebraska's their their first the first Nebraska veterans, not just the first Nebraska unit, but the original veterans of Nebraska were remembered, and that's why I personally picked the first Nebraska. And it's also more convenient since there's already a regiment formed up too. I can join in with them, but that